You are listening to the Reraceables podcast. Hello and welcome back to the Reraceables podcast number 42. I'm your host Tom and it is an exciting night for the Reraceables podcast. We got a full crew here tonight. Josh, Lizzie, Nicole, Jeremy and myself all here. What's up everybody? Hello. Hello again. Hello. So we're here on the pre-show, a few minutes out from episode eight, and I thought our uh, our next little shtick would be a little game of over-under. So basically, I'll throw out a statement, and either you're going to say over or under based on the number that I give and the situation that's presented. You ready to play? Bring it on. All right. So here we go. First one up. Over-under, one and a half legs remaining for Lulu and Lala. I think over because I think Aruna and Natalia are next and then they'll be the next ones to go. I agree. Over. That would be under, right? No, because it would be two legs if they got out after Aruna and Natalia. Oh, so I also under, agree. It would be okay. Under. So let's start this over again. Let's start this over. So <laughs> if I give you one and a half, that means that if you say over, you think they're going to be in two legs of the race or more. If you say under, you think they're going to be in one. Yeah, definitely over. They're not getting eliminated tonight. All right, next one. Over, under, one and a half, team number ones for Kim and Penn, the remainder of the race. They've had back-to-back, two straight. Will they have over, under, one and a half, more team number ones? Lizzie. Under, which means I think they will have at least one more, but maybe not this episode. But for the rest of the episodes of the season, I think they will have at least one more, but I think two more might be a stretch. Jeremy. Oh, over. Come on. Let's go, Kim and Penn. They have been such a strong team these past couple legs. They are on a roll. They definitely got two more wins in them. Josh. Under, I don't see three in a row. And then the only thing that you can win with three people left is the winner. And you would have one, which is still under one and a half. You would need to win both this one and the next one to still be in first place. So. Cool. I, I agree with Josh and Lizzie. I think maybe they'll get one more, but ultimately Dustin and Dusty and Ryan are going to make a comeback eventually. The Holderness family, they're good, but are they that good to keep the streak like that going? I don't think so. Yeah, I think I'm going to go over, slightly over at two. I think they're going to win again tonight and maybe even the whole thing at the end when it really counts. But I think we have at least four legs left. I think they get the team number one twice. They've really proven they're a strong team. Next one. Over Next on. one up. Over under two and a half. Final standing in the race for Raquel and Kayla. I think over. I think they're going to be in the top three, but I think they're a solid three team. Agreed. I think they're going to place third. Okay. Yes. Because I think Dusty and Ryan and Kim and Penn are going to take the first two slots. Yeah. I agree with exactly what Lizzie said. I guess I'm on an island by myself. I'm going to go with the under. I think that ultimately my team purple girls that I had number one, I think they're going to finish either first or second leaning second. I'm really confident in what they've been doing the last few legs of the race. Should I do one more? Yeah, do it. Yeah. Close this out. Maybe one for Dusty and Ryan. Okay. I liked the commercial one or the fill one. The one that doesn't really have to do with logic. All right, Josh, you set it up. So last one, Josh, take it away. All right, let's take this away from logic. Let's go to something that might be a completely random guess with a little bit of logic. How many times are we going to see Phil on the screen? It's only segments within the race before someone finishes onto the mat. Under or over three and a half. I'll say under. Uh, I don't think we've been seeing Phil too much like I think he'll I think it's going to be three exactly I think we're going to see Phil do the usual describe detour describe roadblock and then uh we'll see Phil at the mat for everyone coming in okay I agree with Jeremy completely I think those are the three things that I could think of that is like about Phil and that's 
that's three. So I think I'm, I agree under. I also agree. Yeah. Unless there's like a random segment, like with the maggot cheese, that was like a little addition to the roadblock or detour. But for the most part, it'll probably be three showings. That's exactly why I'm going over. I think it'll be four. I think we're going to have a root info challenge, like a mini one, similar to the maggot cheese. And then we'll have the usual times we see him. And maybe even fast forward, do they still do those? Maybe. Maybe we'll get an extra segment like that or a yield or a U-turn, something like that. We haven't seen anything big like that yet. I agree with you. I'm going to say over. Um, I think that's something. I think we're going to see something for some reason. That maybe he's going to explain what's going on because of COVID. Maybe he's going to do an introduction. I think it's going to be more than three now. Well, we're going to go see something. We're going to pause for now. Stay with us on the Reversibles podcast. We'll be back after episode eight to recap it all. Stay with us. This commercial break is brought to you in part by tribalcouncilblog.com. Be sure to visit all of our social media websites and give us a like or a follow or subscribe. And don't forget to out like, out comment, and out share the rest. Thanks for all your support. Let's start at the end. Kim and Penn, three in a row, $7,500 each. Are they for real? Are they going to win this thing? I think they really could. They have won over $10,000 in prizes that they'll probably pocket after taxes. So I don't know. I just feel like all of these challenges are coming so easily to them. You know, like, and we've seen them be tricky, like the the Saints challenge or the Fish Memory challenge last episode. It's like all these things are tripping people up, and Kim and Penn are not having any problems with anything. They could be winners. I'm rooting for Kim and Penn, and I'm all for it. And I agree, they've been handling everything so well. But like, you know, I keep going back to when Penn talks about his ADHD. You know, there's the hyper focus, but then there's the losing your leaving your keys in the fridge leaving things over the place and i'm just i'm afraid that you know we're gonna see that side of pen in maybe some of the future legs of this race josh are they the favorites yeah i think that they're definitely the favorites and one thing that i'm thinking about is actually if this game weren't uh starting 15 minutes apart or half an hour apart i think that they would have a much bigger lead than they seem to start out in every episode. So even thinking that with a small lead, they're still blowing people out of the water. I think they are just, it just shows how strong of a team they are. Are they the favorites? I think as of now, they are. They don't really have weaknesses that we've seen. Whereas Dusty and Ryan have shown some weaknesses. They're, they can be a little impatient um a little quick to pull the trigger on things but they they seem to just get things right away boom 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 they They know their strengths they know when you know who's better at each task they're pretty good yeah very impressive i think overall as a group we underestimated them i would say overall Some of us had them a little bit higher. Some of us had them down a lot further, but I think they've really proven themselves to be excellent competitors. And I think the favorites by far. And to your point, Josh, the the 15 minutes seems to still be, though it could be a lot longer. I think the 15 minutes still, when you're running a a perfect leg and not making mistakes and not failing the quiz or or not or immediately recognizing a mistake when you're rolling grape leaves that 15 minutes is big and it always will keep you kind of ahead and it's really hard for anybody to ever pass you so let's jump go ahead what time they actually arrived and then consecutively added up because they're running such a strong of a race and not making any mistakes I think it would be compounding more and more and more every episode. I was even thinking they might be more than more than 12 hours ahead of another team and leaving before another team gets back. Well, and don't forget, though, too, there is the airport piece of it that would catch people up and maybe negate that. But I think I, I understand what you're saying. Ultimately, 
their task to task to task accomplishing and navigating and everything in between is far and away. And again, far and away is a relative term considering the circumstances of this season, but far and away the best. And they've proven it now three straight legs. And overall, they've they've been in the top half, I believe, every single episode anyway. So definitely, definitely the favorites. Um, okay. So we are now in Greece. The race has turned to Greece. And along the drive, we get to our first challenge, which is a roadblock. Who likes to rap? And we see this uh, amazing <laughs> little old Greek lady, Mariana, who looks like the greatest grandmother that's ever been who would cook the most delicious Greek food ever and probably any food. She just embodies uh, <laughs> grandmother and excellent cook. Did anybody else get that vibe from Mariana? Absolutely. 100%. You got to have that vibe. If you're going to be the, the experts on a challenge like this. Yeah. So you have to, for the challenge, you had to roll 60 grape leaves in three rows of 20 and mirror the displayed tray. But it seemed to be a little bit tougher than I thought it was at first. I knew there had to be a catch coming into this. It's the amazing race at this stage. We knew they're gonna throw some curveballs at us. And the moment that they revealed that it is the veins of the leaves or the stems of the leaves, that was the kicker. But I was impressed by some of the teams, how quickly they caught on. Uh, Kim noticed it really quickly. Dusty was then, immediate, immediately yeah. noticed it. Yeah, right actually at the table, like while watching for the, what we think is the first time he noticed it. So yeah, I was impressed. Bear attention to detail. I was glad that the grandma was a tough judge because thus far this season, we've had some really lenient judges. This is leg, what, nine? Eight. Eight. Mm -hmm. We need to step it up a little here. Right, you're referring back to like the cake guy. Remember the cake guy? Yeah. Oh, uh, that's uh, instantly uh, where I went to. Yeah, agreed. Yeah, not saying what's wrong, but just saying that it is wrong. That is what we like here. Yeah, we love that on the re-raceables. We're a tough crowd. You need to really step your game up, especially the leg eight of the race. But... I was impressed by Arun when he got there, and I feel like he he kind of came off as like underplayed because he came in last, but he got onto it immediately. He's in the restaurant biz. Um, I feel like he knows to look for details like this. And so it, it was very impressive that he knew that right away, but it didn't seem like it because they were in last place when they got there. So I'll give him credit for that. And that I feel like it wasn't as obvious to, to note it because they came in last, but uh, he got it right off the bat. Josh, did we find a strength of Arun's? Dare I say it? Oh, I love seeing him succeed. <laughs> it was uh, uh, so, so exciting. He has so much passion that watching him um, just, just beam with energy and knowing something uh, makes me feel like a proud dad. <laughs> the air. Can we talk about the air Arun got when they went to go for the clue in the vineyard? Before Natalia pulled the ladder over, Arun jumped high into the air. It actually nearly pulled the whole like tree down. I, for a second, I didn't know if it was Arun or Michael Jordan and or a stunt double, and uh, it was really impressive. Arun worked his ass off during quarantine, and you can tell because he's wearing those Under Armour leggings. That's how <laughs> yes. you know. That's how you know. Either that or he's sponsored by Nike, one or the other, but. And I'm still obsessed with his sunglasses. His oh whole God. look. He looks like a movie star. Incredible. Incredible. There was a clip this episode where he put his sunglasses on top of his bald head and you could see the tan line right next to his ears. I was like, perfect. That was amazing. That made the episode for me. Big fan of Arun at the Travel Council Blog. Wow. Especially after the abuse he took from not being able to find his trousers. I mean, that's... <laughs> I still watch the video. It's just too good. It's too good. But I'm glad that Arun got a little bit of an upswing, a little confidence here. Oh, yeah. We're rooting for you, Arun. We love you here. We, we're glad to see some success come your way. There's room for Arun. But speaking of not always having success, we turn to Raquel. 
Raquel had some struggles on the roadblock and rolling the 60 grape leaves. It made me think like, is recognizing, I know Dusty dinged it really quick, but is rec recognizing that detail easy, difficult, sneaky difficult? I feel like I wouldn't have noticed. That's a very, very specific thing to pick up on. Because like, to me, I would be honed in on like, okay, which sides are they folding in first? And how are they arranged? How many rows and how many, like, you're thinking of big picture, not so zoomed in. I don't know. One could argue that if you were a seasoned watcher of The Amazing Race, you would know to look at details like this. Um, you know, I feel like there have been uh, challenges where people are thinking too much, and I put that in air quotes, like too much about um, the details that go into the challenge. And it's because they've watched so many episodes and they've seen so many teams fail, make the mistakes uh, that that they had this episode and rolling these um, these little leaves. And I don't know, it's like you either overthink it too much or you don't pay attention and you completely miss it. And there's no, <laughs> there's no happy medium. I think what's good about the challenge too is that even though Raquel struggled and we saw kind of the multiple layers of it, people got it right away. Kim who kind of buzzed herself midway through to watch the demonstration, which is another lesson to learn from this, to continue to watch the demonstration. Don't be afraid to go back there. And then we had people like Raquel on the other side of it that just struggled and couldn't quite put it together. But it did seem like if you fail it once, maybe you wouldn't recognize or, or you'll say, oh, I got to rearrange them so that there's three across and then 20 down the long rectangle plate. But then to have the woman pluck out the 10 or 12 or however many you got wrong, I feel like at that point I would have got it that, all right, what are these, how are these ones different than the ones that are left on the plate and the correct ones? And I'd have to believe that I would recognize it there, but I definitely would not have recognized it as quickly as Dusty did. How do you think you would have handled it, Jeremy? <laughs> Uh, I would have been probably the same as both you and Nicole. Uh, you know, I'm probably approached the task thinking about how it's being folded, maybe the orientation of the leaf, but I'm not paying attention to that stem. Uh, however, like you, Tom, I, once she would pluck and separate what was wrong and what was right, I would probably take the time to look at the differences between the two and I would then pick up on it. Yeah, and I think it's I think it falls into that sneaky difficult range because of how delicate it all is and how again your your mind would have probably went to the, the how to fold them versus the way to orient the leaf. Plus, I, I I eat Greek salad, Greek food all the time, but grape leaves are just not my jam. I can eat one, right? I've eaten them before, but I usually pluck those suckers off and you know, offer them around to whoever is the, the highest bidder or whoever really wants them. No offense, but to the grape leaf, it's just not, I don't know, it's a weird flavor there, but I like that challenge. I thought it was good. And eventually Raquel was able to recover and figure it out and, and get on her way. But she did, she did drop. Everybody kind of caught up in that sense. And everybody I think was at the challenge at one time, maybe Kim had, had completed it before all well, five teams were all together. But I really thought it was a great challenge. Raquel and Kayla fell behind, a little adversity for them. But we move on, they were driving to uh, Mamo's, Mamo's Cantina stand for a little bit of a, this was a root info challenge. It seems like if you're in Greece and you're driving to a Cantina stand, is there anything else that you'd want more than a souvlaki? Made in the I don't fully really even know what a souvlaki is. <laughs> I have some ideas from watching the episode, but you know, like, hey, as Lulu and Lala said, probably at that point, I'm hungry. So yeah, let's eat. But you, how do you, like, I was stunned that Lulu and Lala didn't know. Aren't they just DJs in New York City for KTU? Like, don't they have Greek food on every other corner? Or you live in Brooklyn, Jeremy. Like, how do you not have 
any knowledge of a souvlaki. I find that insane to believe. It's all where you decide to go to. I mean, here's the thing. There might be, you know, few restaurants around me that I've never stepped foot in because I have a certain palate I like to continue. So I think I get it with Lulu and Lala, at least, where, I mean, I could tell you what a hero is. I could tell you it's pronounced hero <laughs> and not gyro. How about you? Uh, how about you, Lizzie? Would you have known what a souvlaki is? Are you in on that over in uh, Queens? I think so. I mean, I have eaten Greek food. I am not not familiar with what it is. And I I also don't have a language barrier like I think Lulu and Lala might have. Um, you know, if their brains work in Spanish all the time, it's an extra step for you to go and try and translate someone that has a Greek accent to get to the thing that you're trying to get to. So I, I recognized that when they were trying to figure out this challenge. Um, Although when they threw the paper away, there's no language barrier for just throwing away what's right in front of your face. Can't help them there, but. We were uh, really hoping that they would go for a third Suvlaki. Right, so. Choking it down. That was too. He was like, I kind of hope they have to eat another one. I was yeah. like, she's crying. <laughs> no. <laughs> right. So Lulu and Lala lose their lead. They come out of the the grape leaf challenge in second place. They get lost, they lose time. They end up going to the pit stop somehow, get all the way to the pit stop, but then have to backtrack, turn back, go to the cantina stand to complete that uh, roadblock. And that wasn't a roadblock, I'm sorry, a, a root info challenge with eating the souvlaki, well, spelling it correctly, eating it, and then discovering that the paper that the Suvlaki was wrapped in had a clue for where to go next. Show of hands, and I guess we'll do, or just call it out. Who would have spelled Suvlaki right? I think I would have. I think yeah. it's not that hard. I won the spelling bee when I was in sixth grade, just letting you know. I think what trips people up, though, is how she's pronouncing it. Hmm. If you don't know what she's talking about, then you would struggle in figuring out the letters that correspond. Cause I, the first time I heard it, I was like, oh yeah, it's spelled this way. But then the next couple of times I kept a close ear and I definitely heard some different letters. So if I was in the middle of the race and I heard that, I probably would have misspelled it. Well, she pronounced it with an SH sound. Mm -hmm. And that's why the two people that misspelled it, spelled it with an SH. How did they she were... pronounce it? Shuvlaki. <laughs> that was pretty good. Thank you. <laughs> what do you guys think about the idea of having the clue written on the paper? And the way that the Shuvlaki woman at Mamo's uh, Cantina playing it off like an Academy Award winning actress. <laughs> mm. Very good. Love that it was, you know, right in their hand as they're saying, where is it? What are we missing? And they're holding it. Or they had to go through the trash to get it. Very good. One thing that the Amazing Race does really well is like hiding the red and yellow. Uh, we see it a lot when they're in cities and they have to like find a building and there's like a little red and yellow sign or something, but it's always red and yellow. And I think I missed that in that being the clue um if it was like red writing on a like partially yellow sheet it would make more sense that that's the clue but because it was like dark blue writing on a parchment paper it was like yeah of course you're not going to look at that for the clue um so i wish there was something maybe a little bit more um clever <laughs> and a little bit more distinct but also like like i said clever in a way that it's um uh Detec under, yeah. detectable hidden in, in plain sight yeah. yeah this was like more of like a national treasure nicholas cage level sort of thing uh level clue um as opposed to the amazing race where usually things are very clearly marked with red and yellow uh and people just miss that if they're not being observant I loved it though can I just say that I loved yeah, it, it was great. one thing that oh, yeah. really solidified it as a a perfectly good and appropriate and just the right, I like how you put that, national treasure thing, 
is the fact that going back to it is the fact that Lulu and Lala ate a second Tsubaki. I feel like the producers and creators of Amazing Race got what they wanted in that moment. <laughs> yes. You just don't help. And that's, I'm sure that's what they instructed the woman in the food cart to do is just be like, hmm. And she nailed it. Well, she and, nailed it. And it was I loved well. it that they fo- she followed the conditions being, you know, hey, someone's going to ask you what's the special of the day. And then she's like, Slovakia, but first you must spell it out. I was about and to then- say- the second time they circled back, she was like, but first you must spell it. And then they spelled it and she ripped the paper up. And I thought she was just going to give them the paper, but she turned around and make another yeah. soup. <laughs> like amazing. <laughs> and it worked out that Lulu and Lala were the one team that were like choking it down. Yes. Everybody else yes. like enjoyed theirs <laughs> and they were the ones that were gagging on it. Their poor stomachs. I'd like to think it was the same twin that was choking on the maggot cheese that was choking on the souvlaki. <laughs> I can't tell them apart, and you know, but I I can't help but think it's the same the same girl. I'm sure it was. And I'm sure that tomorrow somebody is going to have a souvlaki waiting for them when they get to their job, or people yeah. are going to be ordering souvlakis into their or calling into the radio show and saying. Hey, yeah, it's Chris Suvlaki over from uh, Greece calling in Lulu and Lala. How you doing? And they'd be like, all right. And they're just going to hang up on and be like, that's an asshole right there. <laughs> Are you foreshadowing that that's going to be you, Tom? Are you going to call into their radio show and do that? If so, Lulu and Lala, this is your warning. Just hang up on him. <laughs> Too perfect of a segment, especially after Penn discovers the clue pretty easily. So does Dusty and Ryan. And even Kayla and Raquel, they they make up time. They're back in third place because they were able to discover the clue and find everything, get there. You know, and then it really came down to, again, we have our, our top three, Kim and Penn, Dusty and Ryan, and Kayla and Raquel, kind of in the front of the pack. And then Lulu and Lala, Rune and Italia in the back of the pack, going into the second roadblock. No detour this, uh, this episode, no, this leg, but a second roadblock. Who wants to be iconic? where they had to listen to a priest's sermon talking about 10 different saints and telling kind of like a story. And then there was a quiz at the end where they had to identify five of the saints in a specific order. I loved this roadblock. This was my favorite uh, favorite part of the this leg of the race. And I love that it was 15 minutes long and when someone new came in, like we saw this a bit with uh, Raquel and Kayla, and we saw this a bit with Arun and Natalia. When they came in, he didn't start the sermon over. He kept going. So, and they didn't know what part of the sermon they were in. So they showed up and they could have been halfway through the sermon. And I love that. What do you guys think was the most difficult part of this particular roadblock? I think uh, at this leg in the race, you're tired. You're mentally starting to check out. And I love that this was a mental challenge that actually made you have to stay checked in. And that's what was exciting for me. I agree with Jeremy, the, the, the cyclic nature of it. But I also just liked how you didn't have to be physically fit to do well in this challenge. I also think that it was fun. I think it was, um, Ryan, that did it the one that Mm -hmm. was incarcerated yep Um, and he really touched on that point too he he drove that home he was like this is the part of you know being incarcerated for the last 10 years that it's like it's not the physical part it's the mental part where you just have to slow down and focus and look at what's in front of you because you can't do anything about it otherwise and i i just am really appreciative that he's giving such a new and i think not widely regarded perspective uh on the amazing race it's like not a lot of people that have been formerly incarcerated are on national television doing stuff like this and so the fact that he seems to like normalize it almost and be like oh yeah this is something i learned uh while i was in prison for 10 years it's like that's something that i'm that's yes. that's normal in yes. my vocabulary now and it wasn't three months ago um so i i appreciate him for continuing to bring awareness to um things that were like oh yeah you just memorized five things do you know what i mean and it's like he's got all of this 
life that's very different than mine. And it's a, a reason I appreciate this show. I think it was a cool challenge for a lot of reasons. And, and that was one of them for sure for me. To further speak on that too, like he kind of said this early on where it was a crime. He was in prison for a crime. He didn't have anything to do with the amount of mental turmoil that puts on you to be incarcerated fully knowing you didn't have anything to do with that crime so, further elaborates the mental obstacles you must face. So uh, yeah, I appreciate you Lizzie and saying all that and just want to further support that. I think it's the hardest part undoubtedly is the going it's a thousand miles an hour a thousand miles an hour and then you have to just hit the brakes and go to a complete stop and just stand there and listen to the priest's sermon for 15 minutes and navigate information remember it make word associations try to recall information as best you can be super patient be patient again and again and again and then take this quiz where you know if you fail then you got to go all the way back and listen to it again it's like a crash test dummy right you're you're just flying down the test track and then you're testing the brakes and then like how good are your brakes in this and i think that's what this challenge was testing and i think that made it the most that was the most difficult part of it from a speech therapist perspective there are a lot of skills that went into this uh task we need short-term memory we need listening comprehension. We need recall. We need attending to a speaker. And oh, PS, blocking out all distractions of, oh, this team's coming in now. And, you know, th this one's yelling that he got it. And this one, you know, it, there's a lot of moving pieces here. And then being able to match the details with the pictures and recognizing that. Kayla was one of the only ones that actually used a memory strategy that we know of that was aired. Um, what was it? And she tried to give herself some identifying piece to each person. So like Anastasia Christmas and like just like keywords, short and sweet to snap her memory and link that and chunk that information which was good well her and pen used pen similar it. techniques did he not yeah pen did it as maybe well. he did sorry pen but ultimately not a coincidence either go back to the fish challenge. right it reminded me of that right go back to the fish challenge from last episode when the four of them raquel and kayla pen and kim were working together and showing similar skill sets to knock out that what was that a detour yeah it was a detour yeah detour and they got it first try so that brings us to the end of the episode ultimately kim and penn finished first as we as we touched on at the top of the uh recap here seventy five hundred dollars each they've won three straight legs of the race miraculously raquel and kayla who had a very up and down leg go from last to first to third and end up finishing second Dusty and Ryan, a very disappointing third place for the third consecutive leg of the race. And then our two bottom feeders at, at this point, Arun and Natalia and Lulu and Lala, battle it out. But in the end, despite Arun and Natalia's navigation, lack thereof uh, skills, they do end up finishing fourth. And Lulu and Lala, dead last and eliminated. Similar to Akbar and Sherry, <laughs> and they're out. Is this fair? Josh, you're shaking your head no. It, it didn't feel like there was much buildup to the end of the episode. Like, usually there's like a balloon inflating and then a, like a, a huge pop, right? And that's what's really exciting about watching the end of Amazing Race. And I feel like this time it was just kind of like, we, we watched the balloon like slowly like and it just kind of went to nothing. And that's, that was the end. The arc of the storytelling is starting to feel, uh, I don't know, maybe I'm not as invested. Maybe I am, maybe they're just not as captivating endings. I'm not quite sure what it is specifically, but I felt like it was just like, 
Well, okay, they're eliminated. This is where we're at. Does the Arun and Natalia nine lives take away from the storytelling, take away from everyone's experience with watching it and the way that this story arc should be playing out? I mean, I think there's something there. Like, they're getting incredibly lucky, Arun and Natalia, with the coming in last whenever it was a non-elimination and then even coming back for the race. But I want to comment on what Josh was saying about the arc of the storytelling. For me, I think a lot of it ties back to how the Amazing Race is handling time this season. You know, we're not, I feel that if we were seeing those big time gaps between teams based on when they finish tasks, even the airport missing, missing a plane by like 10 minutes, you know, there's not much of that happening in this race. So when we're talking about time and racing to the finish and, you know, cause that's the thing too. I'm not, I've, I've thought I've seen this, I don't know, but sometimes in the amazing race, you see a clock, you see a time in the corner of the screen about when teams are arriving, how close they are. And I'm not seeing that this race. And for me, it's not like, it's not nail biting. Uh, like the ending there, I was like, oh, probably Rune and Natalia are gonna get there before. Yeah, they are. But like, I'm not biting my nails. I'm not sweating. Like it's, again, it's that balloon just slowly letting out air. I think it's the co it's the COVID season and that just is what it is. And we need to take that for what it is. And it's the COVID season. So things are a little bit different. And I, I feel like we can't rate it on the same level that we have been for all of these other seasons. Cause it's just, it's so inherently different. They're just dealing with such different circumstances and, and I give them the benefit of the doubt when it comes to that. Like I will extend my disbelief. I will give them the lenience. Do you know what I mean? Like I'm, I, I don't feel as inclined to hold them as such high regard as we have this whole time. But I know that that's just me. And I know that not everybody is <laughs> as forgiving and not everybody should be, but. I feel like we usually get like the editing makes it seem like two teams are neck and neck and they don't reveal who steps on the map first until the very last second and they build up this anticipation and that wasn't done this episode yeah. for whatever reason. I don't know. And maybe that's the missing piece. I, st I still think that the Arun and Natalia piece, much as you like them, as much as they may be, root root forable or root againstable I, either way I, the fact that they've had four chances it feels different to me now than it did when we restarted the race when we restarted the race it was like all right yeah they're in mike and mo they're back great then they get a first non-elimination and then they get another one you got eliminated you got asked back and you had two non-eliminations and then Akbar and Sherry just happen to fall on the non on the actual elimination. Lulu and Lala, same thing, and boom, they're out. But and I guess that you have to accept it. It just I don't know. It just feels like a football team or a basketball team and goes into the playoffs and they have maybe in the in the bubble season and their player, their star player gets COVID and two or three or four of their players are out but the other team has their full team and they're able to play and beat the other team when they really shouldn't have. And maybe to Lizzie's point, maybe that's kind of chalk it up to the COVID season. And that's kind of what this is, but it just uh, it feels, it feels it's, there's something being taken away from me as a, from the competitor standpoint, again, it was one thing when it was, all right, we're going to run the race and bring them back. Are they to do a speed bump? Fine. But the extra life, the extra life, the extra life is just killing me. Go ahead, Josh. I mean, uh, let's compare it to Kaylin and Haley last year. Like, they kept kept not getting eliminated and kept fighting through. And I was right behind them. I was rooting for them. They were the underdogs. It was so exciting to see them stick it out and keep going and keep going. What's the difference now? The break in the season. It's the break in the season. Yeah, it is. Two legs, three legs. And they said, okay, everyone go home for 18 months. And then they brought everyone back and they were like, okay, ready to go. Do you know what I mean? It's like, they, 
they were there 18 months ago. They started this race and now they're having to finish it in a world that no one is familiar with and that nobody knows how to treat it. I feel like after almost two years of this pandemic, we've all kind of learned what the forgiveness is. It's like, oh, I'm I'm not really feeling well today. I'm not gonna come to our dinner party. I'm not really feeling well today. I'm gonna work from home today. It's like, we all understand what that forgiveness is. And I feel like they picked up filming right when we were still figuring out what that kind of was, if that makes sense. This was shot and everyone came back when we were still learning how to deal with normalcy again. And I say normalcy in air quotes because you know, people were starting to get vaccinated at that point and we were trying to go back to what a normal life was, but I don't know if we had figured it out, much less traveling across the world. So there are just so many moving pieces to this season that have not been there for other seasons. And so you're saying that because of the uncertainty in our own world and how to feel, it's mirroring in the show as well. And this uncertainty of how to quite feel about this season and the, the way it's playing out and the, the way it's had to play out. Absolutely. And I think they felt yeah. that when they were running this race and we are feeling it now as viewers. And I think that we're a little more foreign to it because you know the time span from when it was shot to when it's being aired, we've had time to figure our shit out, you know, and um, so we're a little more used to how things are than they were, say, six or seven months ago, whenever they shot this. So I, I feel like there needs to be some sort of forgiveness on the audience's part, just to kind of like understand what the world was at this time, because we were all there for it. So I, think I don't going know. Back to the sports example, too, in basketball, the Lakers win the bubble championship, the COVID year where they did press pause on the season. There was however many months of no no games, no practices, no nothing. And then they come back and the NBA decided to just start the playoffs. Listen to sports talk, talking heads, whatever, radio, people who care about that stuff. And there's a different kind of aura around it. And there was a different circumstance. And people say maybe it was to the advantage of the older LeBron and the Lakers and Maybe it wasn't, or there was no fans, no, no home court advantage. And it's just this other championship that you could argue was the most difficult. You could argue was the easiest. You could argue a lot of different angles on it, but it's not what the other championships are and how they were once settled. And so it's kind of this other dangling on its own outlier situation. So I think that's the way this is as well. I think that's a good parallel. Do you think that there's any feeling of expectation? Um, like, oh, it's so nice to have them in, but they're going to be eliminated quickly. And and what is, you, you use a quote often of like a thousand times you run the race, how far are they going to get each time? Um, and I think it's interesting to think about that we thought they would be eliminated very early. And I think we wouldn't be having this conversation if they were eliminated two tries ago um, or two legs ago. And now that they're still making it through, I think there's kind of a frustration that like, oh wait, maybe this isn't fair to Lulu Lala because at one point we were talking about them possibly winning. <laughs> um, so I do think that that expectation is also a feeling of like contradiction in the game. Like maybe this game isn't fair now that our expectations are not what we're seeing on TV. Is, does this bring us to the cross-offs? I think it must. I think that's a good call. Yeah. Okay. So we're going to cross off Lulu and Lala. Tom and Lizzie still in first with 11. Josh still in third with 12. And Nicole and Jeremy in last place, but closing the gap. Their number seven bottom ranked team, Lulu and Lala, are now out. And they round us, round out the power rankings with a low score of 13. So let's just let's end here on Lulu and Lala. Nicole and Jeremy, you had them seventh. You're dead last. And uh, Josh, you had them fifth. Lizzie, we had them fourth. Were they out too early, too late, just right? Where does Lulu and Lala, now that they're eliminated, where do they kind of fall in our thought process? I'd like to bring up the fact that our power rankings do not change with the elimination of Lulu and Lala. 
which means I believe that they are perfectly ranked in how we ranked them. Because it doesn't affect anything. It doesn't affect anybody. We all place them exactly where we thought they would be placed. I will say though, um, I don't think that I put Lulu and Lala as number four originally. I think that they were a little further back in the rankings for me, but because of the COVID shuffle, capital C, capital S, um, I think that everybody got shifted up a little bit. And so they have fallen a little further into my rankings higher than I originally placed them, you know, but that would not have happened had, you know, teams not come back. So I just wanted to throw that out there as a reminder. For me, they were around the place even before the COVID shuffle uh, yet to be trademarked. But, you know, this is where I knew they were going to be a pretty decent team overall compared to the other teams. I felt that they had strengths, uh, you know, for so looking at this, originally I had placed them at eighth and due to the COVID shuffle, they got moved to seventh. Initially ranked them pretty low. Right. Nicole had them lowest at 10th overall. Compared to that, where my my first impression of them, they lasted longer than my first impression. But after getting to know them and sizing them up against the other teams, I'm surprised that they outlasted Aruna and Natalia. Mm. Yes, overall, we had them fifth, seventh, seventh, tenth, and eighth. I think ultimately, in the end, they kind of shuffled into that average of where we didn't really know where to put that middle group of teams. And they were kind of in the, the top half of that kind of middle portion, which is right about where they fell. And I think if we ran it a thousand times, that's probably where they would have ended up. Again, thinking back to the first leg, they did have, I don't think it was a non-elimination, but it was that, remember the, the first uh, leg in, in London where the leg continued and they had the, kind of a second chance there but a fun team love their energy love their personality i think they really grew from this they really got a lot out of this experience and they were really fun to watch lulu and lala awesome job on behalf of the re podcast we applaud you on your effort in this race with that being said i think that is all we have for tonight i want to thank everybody for being here i love when we have the full crew thank you jeremy josh lizzie nicole be sure to visit all of our social media outlets at tribal underscore council underscore blog. Link in the bio to check out all the Reraceable podcast episodes. Also head over to our YouTube channel, type in the search bar on YouTube, Tribal Council blog. You'll see all the different episodes and all the podcasts that we've had so far. Be sure to like and subscribe. And as always, don't forget, be sure to out like, out comment, and out share the rest. We appreciate the support. The blog has spoken. We will see you next week for episode nine.